talking about out giving God. I'm going to look at Psalm 81.10 first. Psalm 81.10 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Open wide your mouth and I will fill it. This past spring, we had a, a robin build a nest on our deck. We've got a covered deck, so she found a little nook up there to build her nest. It was covered from the rain and the wind. It was safe and protected. It was up high to where any predators couldn't get to her. Well, when I saw that she had done that, I have a camera. If you know me, you know I got cameras everywhere. But anyway, I set a camera up on the nest so I could look in with my phone to watch the progress. And so I saw the eggs in the nest. And then I saw when the chicks hatched and they're there and mom's sitting on them for a while. And I couldn't tell the difference necessarily between mom and dad, but they took turns. They did their job. Well, as the chicks got older, they would fly off. They'd leave them for a little bit to go get some worms, some food to feed them. And the chicks would lay quiet in the nest. They just would uh, sleeping in there, I guess. But as soon as mama got near, boy, they popped up. They craned that neck as long as they could, opened that mouth as big as they could, and mama would drop that worm down in there. And it was really neat to watch. But that's what I thought of whenever I thought about this verse where God says, open wide your mouth and I will fill it. It's that kind of picture that he wants us to eagerly open ourselves up to him, that he wants to bestow that goodness on us. This verse comes at the end of several verses where God is reminding the people what he has done for them. The Bible, the Old Testament especially, is full of references where God does that, where he reminds the people of the things he has done for them how he took care of them in the wilderness when they were wandering, how he led them to victory when they were taking the Canaan land, how he provided for them over and over again. If you go by the number of times God says, remember what I have done, it gets easy to realize that his people have a very poor memory. But I don't know that bad memory is all the problem. The Apostle James tells us in James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes for down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. James reminds us that everything good in our lives comes from God. He adds on that last phrase to simply say, that God always has been a giving God and He always will be a giving God. That is His nature and He always will be that way. The Israelites that David was reminded of God's promise in Psalm 81 were receiving the benefits of God because of God's promise to Abraham. In Genesis 15, we have God saying to Abraham, but Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Abram's a little down. He's a, he'd been told he was going to be father of a great kingdom, but he had no son. He's getting a little on in years, so it's understandable how he's getting a little concerned, a little depressed. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be the one. He took him outside, said, look up at the skies and count the stars if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. God made that promise to Abraham and now, even today, Israel is benefiting from that promise God made Abraham as they are in their land again. To further emphasize this point, 
and this, this amazes me about God, God added, recorded in 15, 18 through 21, to your descendants I give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. God is very definite, very specific in his promises. He defined geographically to Abraham the land he was giving them. He also designed, de, defined culturally by listing the peoples whose land they would conquer and take over. God doesn't give a nebulous promise. He said very specifically, and to this day, when you think about Abraham's descendants, both Ishmael and Isaac, they are in the land that God said his seed would dwell in. They do control that land. That promise is active today. To this day, Abram's sons possess the land. God keeps his promises. In our passages today, God repeats these promises and challenges his people to test him. Sometimes we may shrink back from that. I'm not going to question God. I'm not going to test God. But God's got broad shoulders. He can handle our questions. When you, when you remember what I read there about Abraham, Abraham was kind of down, wondering about who was going to take over, because he was a wealthy man by that time. He didn't have a son. He knew things would go on. And so he, he started thinking of how it would happen. And culturally, that's what would have happened. A servant in his household would have taken over. Abram would have been glad that his household would continue on, but he was sad, of course, that it wasn't his seed. But you notice God didn't fuss at him. He didn't get on to him for doubting. He didn't get on to him for questioning. He just said, that's not, going, that's not the answer, Abram. Some will say, oops, pardon me. So God is talking to his people, telling him to test him and see if he's not true. And that's where our passage from Malachi comes through. Chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. Read along with me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. See if I will not open the storehouses, the floodgates of heaven, and pour out so many blessings that there will not be enough room to store it. That picture there of how much God wants to do open the floodgates of heaven so much that the storehouses can't hold it. Next verse. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. And this passage God promises not only an abundance of crops, but he promises protection from trouble. Some will say that that's just the Old Testament. It doesn't count. That's a foolish comment, but some say that. However, to placate those people, notice what Jesus says in Luke 6, verses 37 and 38. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. And here's the key verse. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Notice again, leave that up for me, how specific Jesus is in his promise. He says it'll be pressed down. Those of you who bake, who have done some baking, know that when you're measuring your ingredients, 
as you put it into the measuring cup, some of them you be sure and you press down. You want to be sure that cup is full, that there's no, no air bubbles, that the recipe says a cup of material, you want a cup. You don't want half a cup because there's a big bubble. So you press it down. That means it's full. It's absolutely packed. Then Jesus says, shaken together. Every one of us has bought some food. We bought potato chips. The bag will be this big and there's that many chips in it. And that's because they settle. That's what they tell us anyway. They filled it up at the store. But then as you travel in the truck, they settle down. Well, God doesn't leave things settled. He fills it up to the top. But he says the, what he gives will be shaken down. It'll be compact. It won't be, again, air pockets to, to fool us into how much we're getting. Then he finally says, running over. In ancient times, ladies would often go to the market to get grain or flour or corn, some different things. And when they got there, they would take their apron and they'd hold it up, making a bowl out of it. And the merchant would dump whatever they were buying into that. And of course, they might have said they were being careful or uh, to not have it spill out so they wouldn't have filled it. But God says he doesn't do that. He says it'll be shaken together and running over. That's the abundance of God as it's poured into your lap, meaning they were holding it. That's how much God was going to bless them. God's nature is to be abundantly generous. In John 10, verse 10, he says, I have come that they might have life and that more abundant. God wants to pour out blessings, and he does. He blesses us immensely. By no stretch of the imagination can we rationally think that God hasn't blessed us, doesn't bless us, and doesn't do it abundantly. If we will take stock of our lives and, and see, a lot of times our wish is that we could look forward and see what's coming, what's going to happen. We can't do that. But we do have the benefit of hindsight. And as we come into stages in our life, we can look back thinking about the trials we've been through, the challenges that we've faced, some tragic, some of our own making, some just necessary like going to school. But we can look back and if we're astute, if we're sensitive to God's hand, we can say, I see him working there and there. He provided here. I didn't think I'd make it, but I took strength. I, I left a job I was doing in Atlanta, manager of a computer center, repair center. God was calling me into the ministry at 35. I had two kids. I had a wife. Uh, that's how I got the kids. And <laughs> felt God calling me to the ministry. I needed to go to college. And I can remember to this day where I was sitting in my house on my couch. It was a Sunday morning preparing for Sunday school. I was teaching Sunday school at the time. And I can remember God saying, do this. And I said, okay, Lord, show me. So I spent the next six months figuring out where to go to school. That's what brought us to Kentucky. During that time, times were tough. Sue was a nurse. She was working a night shift uh, up in Corbin. We were in Pineville. She'd come home, and I'd be at school. I'd come home from school. She'd be sleeping, get up, have supper. She'd leave. I'd take care of the kids. It, it wasn't a fun time. But all through that, we both knew that we knew that we knew that God said do it. And through that whole time, he provided what we needed. We never went hungry. We never went without. Sure, we waited some. Waiting can be good. But he was always there, and that's what God does. And you have those same stories, I know, of how God has provided. 
But notice this, the Luke passage begins with a comparison of several non-material examples. He said, don't judge or you'll be judged. Don't condemn or you'll be condemned. Don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. Or forgive and you will be forgiven. And what I take this to mean in that passage with Jesus following it about give and it will be given to you, and then he describes how, is that it's telling us God provides in more than material ways. God provides in every way. In the Malachi account, he said, I will keep pests from eating up your crops. I'll keep the vines from casting their fruit. And as we think in life, sometimes we think that the answer is we need a check to magically appear in the mail, that we need some kind of provision like that. And sometimes God does that. But most of the time, we probably don't see it because he's protecting us from a wayward vehicle that could cause us to crash. He's protecting us from some disease or illness. He's protecting our home from some burglar that we don't know is out there. God is working to our behalf and all of those things help our life be better by keeping those things far from us. So we can glean from this principle the act of reciprocity acts on every action, not just material needs. Reciprocity is defined as the act of exchanging things with others for mutual benefit, especially privileges granted by one country or organization to another. And that is our relationship with God. There is a reciprocity. As we do one thing, it comes back to us. And that's the message for today. God is a good God. He blesses. He, he pours out blessings. He wants to do more. But He isn't stupid. God isn't a doormat. God doesn't intend to be some sugar daddy in the sky doting favors undeservedly on His people. God does what He does by covenant. A covenant is an agreement between two people. In Genesis 15, and that section about Abraham, God made a covenant with Abraham. Part of what I didn't read is when Abraham's saying that, and God says, you're going to have a seed, good old Abraham says, to God Almighty, I might be scared to get struck by lightning, but he, he knew God. He said, but how can I know this is so? And again, God doesn't chastise him. What God does is go through a ritual of their time where he tells Abram to take a calf, to cut it in half, and then God, represented by a lantern, passes through that calf. That was a way that they sealed covenants back in Abram's day. Abram and God, God made that covenant with him and he became a father of a great nation. A covenant is an if-then clause. If you're a computer person at all, you're well familiar with if-then clauses. We see this in 2 Chronicles 7.14, a scripture we love to quote. But we overlook all that it says. We tend to overlook the if part of the phrase because it says, if my people will humble themselves, submit themselves to Almighty God, acknowledge He is Lord, pray and seek God. Pray not just, Lord, fix this, but Lord, show me your mind, show me your way, seek Him out, and repent. If we'll do those three things, humble ourselves, admit we're doing wrong, admit we haven't done right, admit we fall short, Pray, seek an enlightenment. And once we receive that enlightenment, repenting means turning from one direction, going to the other. If we will do those things, then, God says, 
I'll hear. That in itself is a blessing to know that God hears our prayers. Too many times in life, we all experience this as part of our human nature. We pray and we feel like we say they're not getting past the ceiling, but God does hear. That's, that's our insensitivity or our perception. God says, I will hear from heaven. God says, I will forgive their sin. What greater gift is there? Because our sin is leading us to death and eternal separation from God. And so he provided Jesus Christ to forgive our sin. And then finally he says, I will heal their land. That is something I'm sure every one of us in our heart would like to see in our land today, healing. Last night about, it's either one or two o'clock, I don't know, the time changed. I wasn't real sure what clock when it was. But I heard three reports, pow, pow, pow. I'm pretty sure it was a pistol. I'm smart enough not to go stick my head out the door to see what's going on. But I did to open up my camera. I have a camera looking out. I tried to see. I didn't see anything. We're familiar with those things. It's in our good, safe, rural communities. It's in our cities. There are bad events. We'd love to see healing in our land. We'd love to see peace. We'd love to see people getting along. And God gives us this if-then clause if we will do those things, he will heal our land. So God is willing to pour out those blessings, but he requires something of us. He requires us to take our steps. We see a similar covenant in 1 John 1, 9, another verse we like to quote. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our righteousness. The if there is, if we confess our sins, once again, if we come acknowledging our position before him, acknowledging our life before him, acknowledging that we fall short of what he would have us to do. And we agree with him about that. That's what confession is. Father, I've, I've sinned today. I've committed this. If we do that, then... He will forgive our sin. He will purify us from all unrighteousness. We used to sing some great hymns about that. Whiter than snow, nothing but the blood can wash away my sin. And that's what Jesus does for us. He did it on the cross when he died for our sins. He paid that penalty. But he does it every single time we bow in our heart, if we can't get our knees before him and say, Lord, I messed up again. With fresh grace and mercy, he forgives that. He makes us whiter than snow. He makes us pure and holy before him. And that gives us that unfettered access. God has laid out the requirements for the agreement in Hebrews 11.6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. God requires faith in him if we're to please him. And part of that, that faith is designed, defined as believing he exists. That, that's the start of it, believing he, there is a God, believing who he is, who he says he is, believing Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Savior, and making him our Lord. The second part of that is believing he rewards those who earnestly seek him. It's easy for us to get discouraged, to get jaded, to get down, thinking God is not responding. And we need to maintain the faith that he does reward. We need to ask for vision to see his reward. Because one thing, 
we, we do, and it's, it's human nature, it's natural. We're looking for an answer here, and God's given it here because he knows here's more important and here's going to take care of there. So it's trusting him and his wisdom, but believing that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. When we've overspent or innocently the bills have piled up, we often stop giving to God. That's what led me to this thought. Whenever we have a problem, whenever we want more time, when we want to go on a vacation, we're a little short, we may stop giving to God. Another example is we overextend ourselves on time. There's only 24 hours in a day. There's only seven days a week. There's only 365 plus one sometimes days in a year. We cannot make more time. Sometimes we can make more money. We can do a side hustle. We can do, but we cannot make more time. And God will not make more time. Time is probably our most valuable commodity. But we overextend ourselves. We overobligate ourselves. But when we want to indulge ourselves in something that demands time, or we just want to be lazy, what do we knock out? We knock out worshiping God. We knock out serving Him. We can't get up and go to church on Sunday morning because I stayed up too late Saturday night. Or I've worked six days a week, I'm going to rest on the seventh. And, and we all understand that, and that's life today. But what we do in order to take care of what we want is we rob God. We rob the one who has given us and will give us everything in abundant action. The action of, is like cutting off our nose to spite our face. We have a God who has demonstrated over the thousands of years his abundant grace, his generosity, his care, his protection. We're studying the Minor Prophets on Wednesday and over and over those prophets are saying to the people reminding them of their sin and how God is going to bring judgment. But you know what? That wasn't the first time God said that to them. God had been talking to them over hundreds and thousands of years saying, turn to me. His patience is amazing. That's one of his blessings to us. We break our covenant with God and then we complain that God's not keeping up his part of the bargain. I know lives are busy. Every one of us very busy. We cannot make more time and God will not make more time. But God can make more of our time. What do I mean? If you didn't have to deal with some of the problems you're facing, wouldn't you have more time to do something else? To do the fun things? If things went more smoothly and weren't a hassle, you'd have more time. That's keeping the fruit from casting from the vine. That's keeping the pest away. That's God giving in a way that makes you do more with your time. Be able to do more with your time. Another example, if a car didn't break down or need repair, wouldn't you have more money then? If the water heater didn't break or the roof didn't leak, you wouldn't have to spend that money. If God brought more paying customers to your business or if he helped you be more productive in your work so that you earned a raise or a promotion, you'd have more money. Certainly you would. So see, these are the ways that God can provide that we can dismiss as our productivity, as our benefit, but there are things in our life we have no control over. But God has control. And he can change it to where you prosper, to where you benefit. 
but why would God do that when we rob him whenever we're trying to solve a problem? We can't outgive God, but we act as if we are. When we have another need, we reduce what we give him. We expect him to take up the slack. Proverbs 3 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crop. That's what God keeps insisting on. Place him first. That's where the Ten Commandments start. Honoring God as God, no one else before him. The first fruits. We can paraphrase 2 Chronicles 7 14 thusly If my people will place me first in their lives, then I will meet their needs abundantly. My challenge for all of us today is to talk with and listen to our Savior and our Lord. He wants to talk to us. Just like every one of you parents wants to hear your children. You want to hear about their day. You want to hear what they're thinking. You want to them just to talk with you. As we get older, I know certainly I, I don't know anything to tell my children to get me for birthday or Christmas. What I generally tell is, let's have some time together. Just you coming to the house, us sharing a meal is all I need, right? Just to have time with them. That's the way God is. So I'm encouraging us, take that time Ask him. Don't be scared of him. Abraham kind of argued with him. Lord, you said I'd have an heir, but I ain't got one. God could have said, all right, forget you. But he didn't. He said, that's not the answer, Abram. You're going to have a son. Abram had to wait a long time yet to get it, but it happened. Listen to God. He's not going to condemn you as you come to him as his child, he's going to wrap his arms around you. He's going to absorb your sobs. He's going to hear your request. And as you yield to him, he's going to bless. Find out from him, Lord, what am I putting first in my life over you? What is supplanting you? Lord, I want you to be first in my life. I don't see what I'm doing, Lord. Show me. I'm thick-headed. Just talk to him. Find out what we're making more important than him. Find out what we're trusting instead of him. That's what God wants, is us to trust, place faith in him. Then, when he shows you, and if you don't hear it at that moment, keep your ears open, God will talk to you at the oddest times. But when he says it, say, yes, Lord, and repent. Strive to quit doing that. You may have to strive 20 times a day, every day for a month, because we have it's trouble-breaking habits. But have that heart, I'm going to get this right with God. And then trust God to do what only God can do incorporating this attitude in our life is a great start to this month of grateful thanksgiving. Being cognizant of God's goodness in your life, being repentant for being acting ungrateful, from taking what isn't ours to take, and saying, I'm sorry, Father, I'm coming home. I'll be with you tonight. I'll pick up your word and see what you have to say to me. I'm going to bow in prayer and I'm going to listen. I'm not going to give you a rundown list of things. I just want to be in your presence, God. And I promise you, he will welcome you with open arms because that's what the Father wants. So don't cheat God by saying, I haven't got time. Don't cheat yourself by saying, I can't do that. As God leads, 
and some of the things he's lined out to do. You don't need to ask him, he's told you. Obey God and see, test him in this to see if he will not pour out a blessing like you've never seen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, I pray that you would take this sermon, that you would multiply it, Lord. I feel inadequate in trying to explain just how good you are to us, how much you want to pour out your goodness to us, both individually and corporately. So, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit do that which I cannot do and impress upon each and every heart your great love for them, your desire for fellowship with them, and your wanting to bless them, to give them the desires of their heart. But for it to come from you, not their efforts. For them to give glory to you for the provision. To be able to testify to others what great things he has done. So Lord, multiply these words. Expand them. Please, Lord, open each and every heart to a Take away the hardness. Take the scales off our eyes. All of us need to be closer to you wherever we are on that journey. And you're waiting for us to come. It is in Jesus' name that we can gather here and pray. Amen. <laughs>